Yeah, I'm Steve Jobs now. Hi, my name is Mark Ensley. I'm a software developer. I have an information technology degree and I'm working on an information systems engineering degree. So you may notice something in that, and that's that uh, none of those qualify me to talk about this at all. And I want to let you know that I am not an authority on this subject, and I'd actually argue that really no one is. So what you're getting here is really just my opinion on uh, diversity, inclusion, and the social justice movement. And I understand that this is a very, very uh, controversial topic. You know, I, I want to let you know why I care about it. And, well, how I got into it was when I went to school, when I went to university, I went to a school called University of Central Florida, and one of the first things I did was I wanted to get involved in groups. Because I was always very politically active, and I tended to be more liberal at that point in, my, in time in my life, what I did was I, I joined the College Democrats, and that was a big cause at the time that, that was worked on and, and that I was involved in. And... You know, after that, I kind of just kept following it and tried to get involved at any moment that I could. And it has become something that's very important to me for a very large number of reasons, uh, not all that I can mention. But I'll, I want to give you kind of what I would think is, is the most important one to me. And uh, that's that I, I feel like I have a really good life. And most of my life, I did not spend having a good life. And I just cannot imagine someone being denied this type of life because of something that they can't control or even something that maybe they can control. I really don't think there should be that many barriers to entry, especially because it's a lot of hard work. And it's one of those things that if you feel like you can't do it, you probably can't. So the idea to me of somebody that's like me, but maybe they are a different race, a different religion, you know, we're going to go over some of those things. The idea that they would be denied the type of life that I have is, is really, really, really painful to me. So that, I think, is one of the bigger driving forces that keeps me into this. Now, if you're watching this and you are someone that doesn't like this stuff, I implore you to keep watching because actually what I'm going to talk about is you know, what I think we're doing well and what we're doing poorly. And there's quite a few things that I feel we're doing poorly. Believe me, as somebody that has done work in this space, we are not perfect. You know, people that believe in this, people that work on this are far from perfect. And, you know, I could almost say that might be one of the missteps in the past is people that are kind of highly involved in these types of things feel the need to be kind of this beacon of what you should do as a human. And they're not because they're human and they're not perfect. And they also can't really prescribe their self to you for your life, <laughs> you know? We're all different people, and that's kind of some of the stuff that we're going to talk about here. So let's ta start talking about uh, one of the things that's going right. The idea of better representation in media is one that I strongly agree with, and it's one that started well before the social justice movement. I could even remember being a kid growing up in the 90s, seeing, you know, programming that was more diverse. And by that, I mean, you know, think of the cast of, like, Friends, right? They are not very diverse. And there's not anything wrong with that on paper. Friends is not a bad show. Uh, so why do we need to, to do this? Well, it's what we see in media wouldn't be realistic today if we did it the way that we did a long time ago. And a lot of this started with a show called Star Trek. Space, a final frontier. Star Trek was created in the 1960s and it was way ahead of its time. And the primary reason that a lot of us feel that way is because it put people of racial minority status into roles that were technical and respectable and things that people could aspire to do one day, maybe. I mean, yeah, let's be honest. Anybody that grew up watching in the 60s, they're you know, probably a little bit too old right now to serve on the spaceship that we haven't built yet, but I don't think that's the point. Now, the original series wasn't perfect, right? Uh, women were still really portrayed as uh, things like damsels in distress, and so it wasn't perfect, but for the 60s, it was really, really good. And 
starting, you know, I don't want to say starting in the 90s because that's when I was like alive. And I think it really kind of started a little bit before that. But I really saw a lot of it in the 90s when I compare it to things from the 80s where we were doing the same things, right? Whatever the show was about, we would make sure there was sort of a diverse, at least racially diverse cast uh, in it. And women were taking much more prominent and more assertive roles too. So those were both really good things. And why I think this works so well is because it's subtle and it's not uh, pushing an idea on anyone. You're really letting your viewer watch and think. Now, Star Trek was particularly good about this, that uh, one of the 1960s episodes actually featured the crew of the Enterprise that's dealing with uh, two aliens that they found that won't stop fighting each other, and they can't figure out why. Well, it turns out that one of them is black on one side and white on the other, and the other is black on that side and white on the other side. And this is why it works so well, because... The crew of the Enterprise, the people that at this point in the show you feel kinship with, are kind of sitting back and laughing about it. It's not overtly telling you that racism is bad. It's letting you see a bunch of outsiders, uh, you know, these aliens, alongside the crew of the Enterprise, which is a diverse cast, just kind of not being able to really understand why they're behaving the way they do. So it feeds you the idea, but it doesn't force it onto you. And I also believe that's true for most representation in media, that it's generally not something that I would consider being forced. But there are some small exceptions that people have taken, uh, you know, they've they've had issues with. And that generally tends to happen when uh, a character that has been historically one race is replaced by a character that is a different race. And, you know, I I know the Lord of the Rings, there are some people that are really upset about that because some of the decisions they made there, you know, didn't align with the lore of Lord of the Rings. And I'll be honest with you, I really don't think this is a big enough issue to spend a lot of time on. But I understand why people get a little bit upset about this. They, They feel like they're being forced to make compromises. And, you know, and a lot of times the things that are really, really important to them, maybe they, those things shouldn't be that important, but hey, we're all nerds here, right? I get it. I just talked a bunch about Star Trek. So, you know, it can go a little bit wrong, but in general, it's gone very, very right, I I feel. So now something we're doing wrong, and and that's focus, in my opinion. And what I specifically mean by that is, you know, diversity is much more than just your, your race, your gender, your sexual orientation. Those, you know, tend to be the things that we focus on much more than anything else today. And and in fact, I'd say to the exclusion of everything else. But I've written a little list. And again, this is just coming off the top of my head. I think it gets a lot longer than this. So, you know, you can be diverse in a lot of ways. It can be height, weight, body type, disabilities, medical conditions, your religion, your hair, you know, your eyes, your face, (laughs) just a lot of things about your face. I know it's it's not that big, okay? All right, so what else? <laughs> what you do, you know, what you do for a living, what you do in general, what your hobbies are, there's a lot of diversity in that. And I think a lot of us have hobbies that clearly qualify us as being minorities. So uh, your toes. N- no, I-, I know what people do with that on the internet. You're not seeing my toes. <laughs> what else do we have? Your desires, your fantasies really can qualify you and do qualify you as being part of a diverse community. Now, you yourself cannot be diverse because diversity really talks about a set, right? A set of people. So you can't be diverse just alone because you're literally just one person. But in a group of people, you most likely lend to diversity uh, more than you take away. And, and I think that's one thing that has gone really wrong in this, in this movement, that at least in my perception, a lot of the focus has just been put on, on race, uh, sexual orientation, gender. And I understand why, because some of these could be considered to be more dire issues, right? Uh, race and, and uh, sexual orientation and you know, things like being LGBTQ, those things can really put a person at risk of violence in our society today, unfortunately. A lot of these other things 
aren't quite as serious when it comes to that. So I understand why we have a tendency to want to put all of our focus on this. The problem about doing that is that we start to lose the inclusion part of diversity and inclusion because we're now just focusing on things that you know affect a certain percentage of people but we're ignoring things that make other people diverse and you know I can even think of more things where you lived growing up is a huge thing that can make you diverse who your parents were can make you diverse you know your living situation can make you diverse um, and again now I'm saying make you diverse even though I just said you, you yourself can't be diverse. But I think you understand what I'm saying, that you're lending to diversity with these things. And I guarantee that no matter who you are, you have things that will lend to diversity and help the cause here. So let's move on to the next one. So let's talk about microaggressions. Now, this is one that I feel there's both good and bad things. And when you really start to analyze it, it's very, very clear that sacrifices had to be made here. And I think I understand why. Because initially, you know, we would call something racist or sexist or whatever if it was bad, right? If it was overtly that way. And what we eventually began to realize is that most things that people tend to do that could be considered that way or do tend to offend people are not things they do with any malintent whatsoever. Now, a microaggression can technically be voluntary, and that's where it gets a little bit blurry because racism is also, you know, seen as being voluntary. Now, I actually don't quite agree with that, and, and we're going to talk about that later. But in general, a lot of these things are unconscious, which, you know, doesn't make us want to call people racist. It, it's not a real good way to go about a conversation, right? That somebody is just kind of doing what they always do, and we call them racist. That's not really a good place to start. So microaggressions uh, was really a phrase coined to deal with that. That these things that are not, you know, malicious racism, uh, these are things that we really shouldn't hurt people or punish people for. Uh, I feel like people that really don't agree with these ideas and these movements even the idea that I'm talking about punishing people for it probably makes you cringe, and it should. This is not something that you should ever be punished for, in my opinion. And that's, of course, with some exceptions, right? If you're just, like, completely overtly racist and you walk into whatever you're doing and, and you just start yelling racist things at people, yeah, that's not going to fly, right? And I don't even believe that the person that does that is, is not a victim, honestly. And, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. But at the end of the day, there is a practical limit when it comes to things. And you do have to draw those lines. So, you know, you do hit that wall. But beyond that, you know, we do need to consider that people are just people. And we're really imperfect, especially when it comes to issues like this. And microaggressions uh, do convey that, that, hey, this is not a big deal. The problem is it's adding a buzzword and... Whenever you do too many buzzwords in something, people stop taking it seriously. So that's actually a problem with at relabeling these things microaggressions. The other thing I've noticed is uh, people just seem to kind of make their own up <laughs> over time. So technically a microaggression is, well, the Wikipedia page is getting longer and longer. But in general, it's something that could be voluntary and we generally think of as involuntary. And it, it, it's something that has to, in some way, disparage some group of people. You know, that could be race, religion, whatever. And that is really what a microaggression is. Now, I've seen a lot of examples uh, lately of things that really don't qualify as, as microaggressions. Like, uh, people uh, were saying that uh, there, there is a phrase of, we need to fix this from the supply side. And that comes from, uh, in hiring in workplaces, that uh, there's a lot of workplaces that really aren't as diverse as they could be. And the company's retorts to that are, hey, like, here's every applicant we've received. We're not getting these diverse candidates that you want us to have. So that's where the answer of we need to fix this from the supply side comes from. And it's actually something that, you know, maybe I'll get myself in trouble by saying this since it's a new microaggression, but I believe in this. You know, I do believe in starting young <laughs> and 
and, and involving people of different demographics in the things that we want them to be involved in, in the things that they can excel in. And, you know, if, if that is a microaggression, then, then that's okay. I just did a microaggression, I guess. But that is sort of one of the problems with microaggressions is that there is a strict definition, but it, it just continues to get more and more complicated and more convoluted. And beyond that, people just kind of pitch their own things in as microaggressions. So, you know, there is a, a definition, and I, I do implore you to go look at the Wikipedia page for it, or, you know, just Google it yourself. Uh, it, it gets a little convoluted today. It used to be simpler. And I think we really should have stuck with the more simple definition. When you're trying to get someone to accept things like this, you know, if you make it really, really complicated, they're a lot more likely, people are a lot more likely to just simply walk away. So another big win is diverse spaces. And for a lot of people, this means workplaces, but it can really be any space. And I can say that, you know, I've worked in, in areas that are not very diverse and, and ones that are, and I felt like I was in a very diverse community when I went to college. And I really felt good about that. I enjoyed that. I got to learn more about the world by meeting people that were from different places and of different types of orientations and of different religions. I learned a lot in college because of all of that. Now, were there turbulent points in that? Sure, but unfortunately that is a little bit part of it. And it's an overall great thing, especially when it you know gets going and everything's working well. It's a great thing for everyone involved because you know, for people that may have been excluded, they're now not only considered, but, you know, hired and in these roles. Now, there are studies out there that say, you know, show companies do better when they have diverse workplaces. But you don't really have to read the whole study to understand why this works well. Think about it this way. So if you have, you know, a population of, of people, right, and let's just use gender here, and, and I'm just going to limit this to, you know, simply uh, male and female here. So if you have a group of people, this is 100% of the people, but you say we're not going to hire women or you just in general don't hire women, you know, you have a, a very specialized society today, very specialized. And it's very difficult to find people that are good at doing these specialized things. So you have to go into this pool of people and you have to find the person that is good at this, this very specific thing. Well, let's say that you're not going to hire women. Well, goodbye. <laughs> There's half of your pool gone. And of course, this goes from everything, you know, for everything I listed in my list and the things that I didn't remember to write on my list. So, you know, that is really simple to understand why it's effective when it comes to good organizations and, and profit, For to be honest, you know. We measure this with uh, profit in a lot of cases. So... It is really objectively better. We perform better with it. And it's really obvious as to why. So for a little bit of an aside here, let's talk about why this is such a problem. And honestly, this is how I kind of started my journey, that I was not as on board with these things in the beginning, I would say not nearly as on board, as I am today. And as you can see from this video, there are some things that I still don't think we're doing very well. Uh, but why is this such a big problem? Because my thought process in the beginning was, why can't people just not be racist? Isn't it simple? You know, I've seen a lot of other people say similar things. And unfortunately, it hasn't been. You know, it hasn't been. And there are reasons for that. There are a lot of different schools of thought. And I just want to tell you my school of thought. You know, this is just one of, of several. And it has not been proven. But it really is, in my opinion, an evolutionary thing. And here's why. When we were cave people, and by the way, I'm not going to actually judge the cave people here as to if they did the wrong or right thing. But if you, you know, when you were a cave person, let's say you, know, you have your kin. You have a small group of people that are genetically related to you. And you are just trying to survive. Well, if you leave your cave or den or whatever, and you walk out to forage for food and you run into someone that doesn't look like you, 
by the way, they're likely not a different skin color. They just will look different in more subtle ways, but it will hit you hard because your kin look very, very similar to you. That's bad news. It's, it's very bad news for you, and it's very bad news for the person you ran into. Because in general, the way this you know, would go would be the more aggressive person would win. Uh, you might say, well, why not just be peaceful? Why not just live together? Well, when you're foraging, you, people are moving out from your settlement. And you're moving further and further out to gather more and more resources. So you run into someone else. You now have a, a different group of people with a different gene pool that you have to compete with over those resources. So if you don't fight immediately, you're probably eventually going to fight when the resources start to get low. Now, this generally goes well for the aggressor, the, the person, you know, the, the kin, the, the tribe that is willing to kill the other one immediately generally survives, and uh, the one that doesn't, doesn't. So we have been a bit programmed by our, our history and evolution itself to be aggressive or distrusting of people that don't look similar to us. Now, all that being said, you, you might feel like it's hopeless after I just said that, but it's really not, and that's because, you know, we are still evolving, right? And humans are pretty darn adaptable, too. And slowly over time, travel became easier and easier. For most of history, it was still so hard that you didn't have a lot of mixing of, of races. But eventually, you know, ships, horses, things like that made travel a lot, lot easier. You know, and then eventually we have airplanes, which is just really, really easy. And this is, in my opinion, where a lot of these problems come from. That there's still a little bit of that programming left in us that wants to be fearful of, of people that don't look like us or people that we perceive to be unlike us. And it is completely justified based on the way we evolved. But it, it, it does not work today. And I can kind of give you an example that... You know, when people are coming over to America on a ship of different ethnicities, it's really um, beneficial for everyone, for those people to be accepted and for everyone to work together. We know that we're better if we do. Yet, you know, we, we still have the tendency, and I do say we here, as a species, we have the tendency to have a knee-jerk defensive reaction. And, and that's why. So that is actually something that you could consider to be a mental disorder. And I say that because, you know, a lot of us have things, right? Like, if you're afraid of bugs, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a mental disorder as long as it's not interrupting your life. But this sort of does. This is an example of a, a situation where that instinctive behavior actually hurts the individual. And... Uh, Let's talk about unconscious or subconscious bias. And this is basically the idea that you can have kind of a bias that would cause you to judge someone more poorly than you should, but you don't know that you have that. Now, this can be a really problematic discussion because it really can't be proven either way, especially for each individual person, as to whether or not this is a factor but at the same time, we do tend to agree that it's probably a thing, right? And there are tests that you can take where you put in the race that you are and you choose some other race. And I'm sure by now they've got other things than just race. And the idea is that you're going to begin by associating good words with your race and bad words with the other race, the one that you chose. And so you're going to do that for about half the time. And then in the middle, it's going to stop. And it's going to reverse on you. And you're now supposed to say good things about the other race and say bad things about your own. Now, what this really only does is it takes advantage of task switching. And there's, there's probably a, a better psychological term if I were a psychologist that I don't know. And if anybody does know, please put it in the comments below. But really what happens is that you are told to do a task and you start to get good at it about halfway through doing it in one way. Uh, by now, your attention span is withering a bit, and then you're asked to invert that task and do the exact opposite of what you've been doing for the rest of it. So this is really, you know, any, I think anyone that's played video games can kind of understand this, that when 
the controls change on you really quickly or the objective or whatever, it's going to be a little hard for you and it's going to be, you're going to be a little slow to actually change how you behave because you have just spent the last minute, you know, doing things the way that you were doing them. So another problem with these is they regularly produce results that are ridiculous that you can take it one time and it will say that you hold some kind of unconscious bias towards this race. And then you can take it again 10 minutes later and it'll say you don't. So really these tests, in my opinion, are, are not helpful. Uh, they, they don't really represent anything. And telling people that, hey, you know, you're racist and you just don't know it doesn't help. There's really no actionable solution there. So when it comes to unconscious or subconscious bias, it's one of those things that while I think well-intended, isn't really serving much of a purpose anymore. Let's talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect. Now, yeah, this is another bad one. Uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect is something that you might associate with dumb people thinking they're really smart. And that's really not what it's about. It actually really applies to skills in general. But this, in my opinion, is a skill. It's just one that's very difficult to pin down. And you know, the Dunning-Kruger effect happens in things like, like programming. And, and what it basically means is that you have this curve, right? And as you get better at something, especially when you're first learning it, you tend to have a lot more confidence as you learn more and more and more. And when you're at the top of this curve, it feels really good, but you're about to be in for a bad time. Because you realize at some point with whatever skill this is that you don't know everything and you never will. And it's, it's a really not fun thing to go through, but it can be a little bit more problematic when you're at the top. And that's because it means that you really aren't as well educated as you feel you are. And you may have the tendency to take on things that are really above your pay grade. And I feel like this happens a lot with diversity inclusion. And, you know, I don't know if I really, uh, would pull the social justice movement into it. But this is a skill, right? It's a skill. It's an understanding. It's something that you have to learn or you can learn anyway. And we do have a tendency, I think, in the beginning to walk away from the, you know, the things we learned in the beginning thinking, I am going to make the world a better place, which is a completely commendable attitude for you to have. It really is. And I've been there too, guys that I have been that person at the top of that curve that felt like I could fix the entire world with this stuff and everything else for that matter. <laughs> but it's just, it's not real. When you're at the top of that peak, you're, you're not really as, as experienced as you think you are. And this is where really bad things can happen because this is sort of, you know, putting someone through a few hours of training and then, you know, telling them that, all right, you're, you're qualified to do this now. You're qualified to have these conversations. That um, isn't always a good idea because they'll walk out feeling that that's the case. And if they mishandle that, it can cause bad situations. It can make situations worse. And it's really not something we should be doing, in my opinion, that we shouldn't be pushing people forward with a, you know, an action item to, to work here. That when we teach these things, we really need to send people forward with a, hey, please keep studying uh, message, right? Not really a, hey, go out there and take action, but more of a, hey, you know, keep researching this. Put your toes in the water really, really slowly. And you're not required to do anything at all you may never behave differently based on this, this training or this knowledge you've received. It may not change anything in your life. It, it might not, you know, hopefully it won't actually, that hopefully you are already in a good enough environment where it won't make a significant difference. Um, and yeah, you may be faced with situations that you do feel like you should you put your feet in the water a little bit faster and that is still your decision. But just keep in mind, you know, this is becoming an entire field of study, and I do believe there are degrees on, on this at this point. But you're not going to be an expert just by going through a class on it or listening to this video, for that matter. I'm not an expert on it, you know? 
And I feel like the Dunning-Kruger effect is incredibly powerful when it comes to this. Because when I meet people that have spent more time in this space than I have, I feel like they have less confidence in their abilities to always perfectly not be offensive. And you know, to an extent, I feel like there's a doubt that we can ever get to a better place too with it because it does seem so futile at points at times, but I, I wouldn't want you to think that way. It, it's, it's more just realize that this is not as simple as it might sound and it can be in a way dangerous to get into these conversations if you're not really ready. And you may feel that you are, but you need to humble yourself because if you feel that you're ready, that almost says to me that uh, you haven't really thought about it enough, that you have to understand that going into these conversations, one, listening is one of the most important things that you can do. Two, it's very difficult to do that, especially you know if the situation escalates and you feel like you're being accused of doing something wrong. It can be very, very difficult. That's something that I struggle with personally, that I have the tendency to become very defensive if I feel like I've been accused of doing something wrong, mostly when I adamantly do not believe I did. And, you know, my tendency is to kind of double down. And I think a lot of people have that tendency. But it's something that is really counterproductive in the space. And I think a lot of the issues we have around it comes from things that came from the past. That initially, uh, diversity initiatives would be a little bit, uh, they punish you if they felt like you messed up. So a lot of us feel like, you know, we're going to be punished if somebody was offended by something that we say. And you could be, depending on where you work. You know, that very much could happen. But if it does, uh, your workplace needs to know something. That is the exact wrong way to go about this. That uh, reprimanding someone for making a mistake like this, I don't even know if it's fair to call it a mistake. You know, when we talk about things like microaggressions, it's really not that person's fault at all. They really didn't do anything wrong. And that doesn't mean there's not something that needs to change, but it definitely means this person shouldn't be reprimanded or, or punished for, for, for these types of things, especially when we talk about it as a microaggression, because you know, those are really defined as things that are not uh, really that person's fault in general. And it's important to talk about it. I, I really do believe that the best way to deal with it is to talk about it. Generally, it's better, uh, depending on the exact situation, of course, but it's generally better if it's not done in front of a large group of people, that you'd be better off doing a one-on-one -on -one if you feel you're safe to do that. And if not, maybe have a few more people involved. You might find that if, if you're the person uh, that's taken offense or someone has said something to you that made you very defensive or, or very, you know, feel very insecure, you might be surprised uh, by how these things go. That most all of the time, the person that you feel slighted you really had no intention of doing so and really won't understand why. And so that is something that you also need to be prepared for if you're going to, you know, talk at, from a, a standpoint of, I, I don't want to say a victim, but someone that has uh, felt slighted in some way, that it will help if you can elaborate, you know? And this is difficult to do. This is very difficult to do, especially in the moment, because a lot of times something makes us upset and we don't really understand why. We have a feeling behind it. We have a feeling behind it, but we don't, we can't really elaborate as to why. It, a lot of times, at least for me, I need to really sit and think about it for a long time before I can elaborate why something made me feel insecure, defensive, or just plain hurt. You know, it, and it does happen. And that's one thing that I want to see a lot less of when it comes to diversity and inclusion, as I feel like I've seen way too much hurt. And what generally happens is, you know, a person might be reprimanded for saying something they, they really didn't feel like was wrong, and in some cases really isn't. And then they want to have nothing to do with this at all. And I'll be honest with you, I don't blame them. You're kind of drawing them out for who they are and how they behave and telling them that they're a bad person for it. And that is just not going to make any progress. It's not a good way to move forward with these things. 
And I guess that's, I keep giving you complaints, but this is my next complaint. Let's talk about the LGBTQ plus movement. Uh, this is actually somewhere that I think this, you know, this was more from the social justice movement, in my opinion, as to giving this a lot more visibility. So I give the social justice movement credit for that. And, you know, if you don't know what this is, it, it basically refers to, you know, different sexual orientations. And a lot more than that, actually, too. <laughs> so, uh, but it is generally uh, centered around things like gender and sexual orientation. And I feel like it's done a really good job, uh, especially lately, that a lot more awareness has been raised in a way that I don't think was really that I intrusive, you know, to others. I think it was actually pulled off very well. And the plus is a big thing in the, you know, I don't want to say the whole acronym again. It's actually a big thing, and there's a lot of things under that. You might be surprised. You may actually fall under under this. So one experience I've had recently, though, and I, I think this isn't really so much of a shortcoming as it is just a bit of a limitation of society, just telling people that you should accept people that are transgender, you know, that's not really going to go that far. It didn't for me anyway, that, you know, I do have some qualms uh, with, with it. Really only, uh, concerning the English language, that I'm really into the English language, it's my first language, and I've learned it pretty well, I think, but we are modifying it in some ways, and I'll give you an example. So if somebody, you know, identifies, you know, their pronouns are they, them, there, uh, so generally the word they is used to refer to multiple people, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, if if uh, somebody leaves a backpack under a tree in a park, you might pick up the backpack and said, hey, who left their backpack here? Well, you could look at that as you're really only referring to one person, right? Although technically you could also look at it as uh, you're referring to a subset of people that could have possibly uh, left their backpack there. But it gets a little worse because when you go in, into they, uh, if you're using the word they for an individual, do you say they are or they is? Well, uh, the agreed upon answer at the moment is you say they are because, you know, saying they is would just be stupid. It would sound dumb anyway. The problem with that is that it's adding another exception to the English language, which, you know, for those that don't know, and I can't really speak from experience, the English language is one of the most difficult languages to learn. And I really don't think we should be making it harder for people that are trying to pick up English as a second language, because it's really already very difficult. So I feel like we have a little bit of work to do on the language stuff, although we might just have to leave it there and unfortunately make some compromises. But what I found was uh, interacting with a person that's transgender and working with them and getting to know them, that is really the best way uh, to kind of fall in love with this movement. And, and I feel like I kind of have. I'm, I'm very happy with what I've seen from it. And I, I, think, uh, it's being, I think it's being pulled off very well. Let's talk about defund the police. Or maybe we just really shouldn't talk about that. Um, no, that's the whole point of this, is if you can't talk about it, something's wrong, right? Defund the police, on all the things that are on my list here, easily the biggest abject failure. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons that, you know, why that happened, and I'm going to try to cover all of them. So, really what happened with that was there were a lot of protests around this period of time, generally around uh, George, George Floyd. And those protests, I'm not saying they were not uh, warranted. Now, I will say that I'd never believe in violence when it comes to spreading your ideas or, you know, helping people to understand your ideas. It's just really a really bad route to go. Uh, pretty much has the exact opposite effect. And defund the police did too. That we were just simply listening to the loudest, most rambunctious group when it came to this, when it really turns out that the vast majority don't support it at all. And because it was entertained, it hurt the very communities it was intended to help. And I think that's a big deal, personally, that that's kind of full circle for the justice movement, or maybe 180. Uh, 
And if the social justice movement goes the way of the wolves because of it, I wouldn't really be that upset about it because I feel like it's just social justice. The term in general has become very, very stained. And, you know, generally when you bring up the word social justice, you will not get a good reaction. You know, of course, depending on the group you're putting it in front of, but it definitely got hurt a lot by that. And going beyond that, uh, violence is just not the right way to spread these ideas at all. You couldn't pick a worse way to spread these ideas than violence. And what I saw during that personally makes me ashamed and at a point made me want to retreat from this uh, because I really do not believe in violence. Uh, I don't feel like I should have to explain myself with that. So the social justice movement, I wish the best for it, and I still feel that I'm in a way a part of it, but I don't think it's gone in the right direction in general. In fact, I generally tend to think, uh, I don't want to say the majority, but a very large portion of the ideas that came from it were very bad ones. And I think a lot of that comes from the aggression with uh, social justice. Think about the word justice, you know, if you look up the definition, it totally fits with social justice. It's fairness, right? But the word justice to a lot of people means someone needs to be punished. And the way that this movement behaved over these periods of time solidified that, you know, to people that were not on board yet, it basically told them that they're the enemy and they're going to behave the way that you want them to behave or there will be violence. You know, I think that is how a lot of people took it that we're not in this space. And I cannot really think of a more destructive thing to do within this. I honestly don't know if we can recover from it, if I'm being completely honest. Violence is just not something that will help you accomplish your goals today. And it certainly won't help in a space like this. So the target audience is, I think, something that we haven't really been thinking about here. And I don't know if we ever really have been, but we should be. And that is to say, when we construct new ideas like this, when we construct new strategies to build better communities, we need to be thinking a lot about who we're speaking to and who we need to speak to. Because I personally feel that a good majority of the population is really already on board with this. And we really want to be speaking to those that are not currently. And, you know, I think there's a lot of ways we can do that better. Uh, one is that we need to understand uh, the defensive or I should more say the insecurities that people that are not buying into this have uh, because there's many and some of those may be why those people don't want to become involved. Now I'm not saying that everyone has to become involved. In fact, I, I'd really put it in quite the opposite way that this is really a more subtle thing, at least it should be. And treading lightly making good decisions and thinking about things deeply is going to get us a lot further uh, than things like violence and being in your face when it comes to this. And the reason I believe that is because people just don't tend to respond well to prescriptions given by people that they didn't ask for. You know, they didn't ask for this is generally a lot of that mindset when it comes to people that are kind of rebellious against this. And, you know, I'm all for rebellion. I'm a pretty rebellious person myself. I have found myself as a rebellious person against a lot of these things. And I feel like in making this video, I've rebelled against the things that I disagree with. And it's important to realize that this might not all be correct. And some of these people that dissent might actually be right. Now, that's something that I've seen, though, where we generally 
put up these walls and try to make strict categorizations and we make ideas that are very strict when it comes to this. One of the bigger ones I think is bad is uh, the idea that offering solutions to problems, uh, that is actually starting to be labeled as microaggressions. And they shouldn't be. First of all, they're not. They do not meet that definition. And the main thing is that a lot of us, myself included definitely, I, I pride myself on someone that lives in the solution space. And that is to say that you can live in the problem space and you can dig up a problem, you can figure out everything about the problem, and you can describe the problem in detail. But the solution space means you're focused on solving the problem. Now, I understand why people that are more solution-based, you know, why this can be problematic for them. Because there aren't really easy solutions to this. And, you know, as someone that lives in the solution space, it can be tempting to offer up solutions that are not really good solutions because there really aren't very good solutions right now. So I, I just don't think though that when someone tries to provide a solution, they should be labeled badly or seen as you know having a microaggression over it because I really do not see it that way, that these people are very much just trying to help. And honestly, if you ever wanna get anywhere, you need people from the solution space. Yes, we have the tendency to grasp at straws if we can't find a good solution, but hey, you need us around, okay? When we finally are getting there, uh, you're gonna want us around. And, and the thing about it is, what about the end game, right? What is the end game? What's the end game of social justice? What's the end game of diversity and inclusion? Well, I'd actually say they're, possibly quite different, although they're, they're not really there. You know, that's the biggest issue I have with it. That I don't know that we have a, an agreement, well, on anything, first of all, but more so, what does this future look like? This future that we're building towards, you know, what does it look like to you? Uh, to me, it looks like Star Trek, where race, gender, all of the things I listed down there, you know, on that notebook I had, are not factors in our lives, or at least not major ones. Now, it's hard for me to believe that we'll ever get there. And I do see some ways that we could get to something almost as good. And this is gonna sound kind of funny, but things like racism, sexism, any kind of discrimination, I see a world in the future where that is uh, simply comedy, right? That it's just used as comedy, uh, you know, you make fun of each other, but it's not taken seriously. Now, we're even a long way away from that. And, you know, that's one thing I like to think about is that yeah, there's a long way to go here. So let me get to my conclusion. All right, guys, I, I know this has been a really long video. Uh, there's a lot of things I believe in uh, with this, a lot of ideas that I had that I think, you know, we could use to make this better. The biggest one being inclusion needs to be at least put in bold, if not put first. I think that a big misstep we've we've done from the beginning is to think about diversity before inclusion. And I, I do generally think we tend to do that, uh, that we are more concerned about the offense than we are about involving people. And that's just not the right way to do it. it, it it's, inclusion should come first. And beyond that, I'm, I'm really admitting here that a lot have, of missteps have been taken over the years with this. And when it comes to the social justice movement, you know, whatever happens to it happens, in my opinion. But I think we need to learn from what happened. And we really need to take this back to the basics and we need to analyze what's gone right, what's gone wrong, as I've been doing here. And we need to think about, you know, what can we do that will be more effective and not what do I want? Because a lot of times 
what you want and what's effective don't match up, but you can get what you want by doing something else that is effective. And it's really hard to figure out, right? A lot of times the only way to figure out is to test it, unfortunately, which a lot of these tests, in my opinion, have really not gone that well. But on the other hand, many of them have gone very well. And the beauty of that is we can keep the things that work and we can ditch the things that don't. And that's all well and good, but I, I feel like the next iteration of this, we need to strongly consider the reactions of people that are resistant to these ideas. It might be too far gone. It might be too badly damaged at this point. And that's hurt. That's hurtful for me. It, it feels painful to say that. But after some of the things from the end, well, I want to say the end, it's still around, more recently in the social justice movement, I think it led to a lot of division. And of course, it was not the only thing responsible for that. I am not saying that. There's a lot of other things to talk about when it comes to that, and there's just simply not the time in this video to talk about them. You know, obviously, a lot of that came from more than just the desire to be diverse and included. I think it even came from a lot more than wanting social justice. I think there's a lot of factors that played into this. And there were a lot of people that are very resistant to these ideas that were also very, very bad actors. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to place all of the blame uh, in division on the social justice movement. I'm, I'm really not. But I think it made things worse. And I think, I really do believe that is because social justice was not really focused on inclusion. And inclusion is very important for any of this to work. And we want this to work because we want to build better communities. We want people to have equal opportunities. And I personally, I only want to speak for myself on this one, I don't ever want there to be a situation where because of things that someone has chosen in their life or is just how they are, they can't have the type of opportunity that they want or they just get passed over. And that's just not acceptable to me. And the reason why is because I, I feel like I'm really lucky to have what I have today. And I don't know what my life would be like without it. I don't think it would be very good. And for people, people like me that are, that are passionate about things, you know, I, I really do feel like there's not a lot worse in this world than, than denying that to someone. That's, that's how I feel. I'm sorry if I sound a little bit emotional about that. I, you know, a lot of you guys have watched a lot of my videos, you know, a little bit about my life and my upbringing. And uh, I just am not okay with that. Yeah, I, not okay is putting it very, very lightly. And, and beyond that, in general, I enjoy diverse communities. Uh, I like to learn and I like to understand different things, things that are different than what I know. And I like to learn new ways of doing things. And uh, it's just overall beneficial to me. I, I really do feel that way about it. So, so anyway, sorry, it, it's, it's a difficult situation, right? And I think one thing we've learned from the whole thing is, man, as humans, we really suck at this. You know, it, it feels like it's more difficult than, than things that are very, very technically complicated. And I find that to be very interesting and challenging. That's another reason I like being a part of it. And I hope that in the future, you know, I hope our next iteration, it, you know, I hope it's better than, you know, the last one. I, you know, not to say that it was, it was all bad. It certainly wasn't. There was a lot uh, good that came out of it. And, you know, I, I, felt, I, I feel like I've really grown as a person being a part of this, that I've come to understand the world better. 
and I've come to understand people better. And for whatever reason, I find that to be very important. And I feel like you should too. So I want you to understand, if you're somebody that, that is just not into this kind of thing, if you've been burned by it before, especially if you've been burned by it before, uh, just take it from me here. You didn't deserve that. You really didn't. Uh, this is something everyone's working on. And some of the worst parts of this are, you know, the virtue signaling that happens when people feel like they are in this space and they are fighting for diversity, inclusion, or even social justice. That is actually where some of the worst things happen. Okay, guys, if you made it this far, you better give this video a like. <laughs> Come on, hit the button. Thanks for listening to me. If, if you have any disagreements, again, please feel free to post them below in the comments. I understand that I am very imperfect when it comes to this. I think we all are. And you know, I wish you a happy holidays and have a good night.